and welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. In today's lecture, we're going to be going a little bit further into the autoregressive process. If you recall last time, we were trying to do forecasting. We were trying to do linear forecasting, and we ended up with a big linear system of equations. It's hard to solve. We need to figure out a way to do it. And today we're going to talk about two different algorithms to solve that system of equations. Trying to do forecasting and trying to get a linear predictor, there are different ways we can go about it. The first thing we're going to talk about today is something called the Durbin Levinson algorithm. And the main idea is well, we want to predict the t plus first data point based on the previous t data points, just like we did in the last lecture. But now we're actually going to do it for real, and we're going to use specific properties of the Toeplitz matrix in order to come up with an algorithm to solve that system of equations that we saw last time. Going beyond that, though, there's a whole nother way we can approach it. Instead of having a linear combination of the data points, we're going to have a linear combination of the residuals, something called the innovations, and this is going to lead us to an innovations algorithm. It's innovative, it's kind of interesting, and we're going to look at it today in today's lecture. So let's get over to the notes and see what's happening. And welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. Today we're going to go a little bit further into the idea of forecasting. It's what we started with in the last lecture, the idea of forecasting for an autoregressive process. But now we're, we realized after the last lecture, it's not straightforward, at least mathematically it is, but algorithmically we have to figure out what to do. Luckily, there are two different methods that we'll be discussing today the Durbin-Levinson algorithm, and the innovations algorithm. We're not going to go into excruciating detail on these, but we will look at them and try to get a sense of where the ideas are coming from um, so that you have some intuition going in when you're using software that might have implemented these methods. So let's just jump into the notes and see what that's all about. All right, so where did we leave off last time? Well, last time we had this idea that we wanted to do forecasting for the, well, and just in general, in some sense, um, we were specifically thinking about the autoregressive process, but ultimately we really just wanted to come up with some prediction, X hat, we'll say capital T plus one, which is gonna be the prediction based on some linear combination. I guess I'll leave out the I will leave alpha, we'll put alpha naught in there, why not? No, it's just going to get in the way. <laughs> we'll forget about alpha naught. Assume it's all mean zero, there is no alpha naught. We already got rid of it. Anyway, um, yeah, the idea is that we want to do some type of linear predictor. And our linear predictor is going to look something like, well, this. It's going to be a big linear combination of all of our data points. And what we saw from last time is that we can actually solve this. Well, first we can write this as vector alpha transpose vector x. And this, we found out, can be written as k transpose gamma inverse x, where k is a big vector of auto covariances, kx1 all the way to kx capital T. Now I'm going to make sure I didn't write that backwards because I think I wrote it backwards. Yep, I wrote it. Wait. Yes, I think I wrote it backwards. It's supposed to be k capital T, kx at capital T all the way down to kx at 1. Um, and then our gamma matrix here, our gamma matrix, is going to be the big matrix of auto covariances from 0 on the main diagonal, kx at 1 on the first off diagonals, and so on all the way up to the corner where we would have a kx at, I guess, capital T minus 1. Yes, good. 
And over here, I guess we have another KX0. All right, so we have our giant matrix of auto covariances. Again, we can't actually compute all of these um, in any reasonable way because we'd have to estimate it from the data. But in a mathematical sense, we have a system of equations that we want to solve. So then the question we were left with last time is how to solve this system of equations even if we knew what kx at various lags hr, let's say for h, say from zero to capital T, which typically we don't actually know that. We'd have to estimate it from some data. But in this case, the question is, even if we had that, how are we going to do this linear, solve this linear system? Because again, inverting gamma is, well, annoying. We don't really want to have to do that to find, because I guess that's not technically the linear system. The linear system I'm talking about is going to be gamma, let me think. Yes, gamma, well, it's alpha transpose is equal to K transpose gamma inverse, which is a kind of a weird way to write it. But if we transposed everything, it would look like alpha is equal to, not K, sorry, gamma inverse, which is symmetric. So I don't have to transpose it, or I guess I do, but it's the same thing, um, times K. So again, we have a big system of equations. We want to solve it. How do we do that? Um, strictly speaking, I guess it should be K is equal to gamma alpha, where alpha is the unknowns. If we want to write it as an actual linear system of equations, the point is inversing gamma is kind of annoying. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to discuss is the Durbin Levin Levinson algorithm. So the Durbin Levinson algorithm actually isn't really a statistics thing at all. It's uh, from numerical linear algebra. Actually, to be honest, I don't know the origin of either Durbin or Levinson and what they were studying, but this is more of a general way to solve a system of equations in linear algebra that just so happens to be super, super useful in the context of forecasting for time series, which is why it shows up in like every time series book or textbook that you might pick off the shelf. Well, anyway, so what is this doing? So like I said, what we're trying to do here is solve um, that system of equations. Uh, so before we go forward, we have to define something. We're going to define or we'll put in some notation. We've already talked about what this is, but our notation is we're going to denote capital P of T and T plus one, which is kind of annoying notation, but uh, we're going to have to run with it. This is going to be the mean squared prediction error where we're going to have X T plus one minus X hat T plus one squared. And yeah, I guess this is all within the expectation just to be precise about it, even though it's just a lot of brackets to keep track of. Um, and we saw in the last class that this is equal to the auto covariance at lag zero, just the variance minus this K transpose gamma inverse K. Yeah, no transpose. So again, the mean squared prediction error can be thought of as being the variance of the white noise process minus some other term here where this other term is going to tell us how correlated our, val our, our time series is with itself. I guess how auto-correlated it is. If the time series has strong auto-correlations, this thing will be bigger and our mean squared prediction error would be smaller. So there's two extreme cases. Maybe we can do a side note. 
two extremes. The first is that if x is just w, that is if xt is just w, t is just white noise, then, well, what happens? Then kxh is equal to zero for h greater than zero. And, oh no, you can still invert that matrix. Good, because the diagonal's just, okay, so it, does, it still makes sense. And then we have that the, um, well, using this odd notation with the p, t, t plus one, uh, this is just going to be kx is zero, which is just the variance of xt. So again, what it's saying is that if you have a white noise process, then even if you have lots and lots of observations of it, predicting the next guy, the mean squared prediction error is just the variance itself because there's really nothing you can do to predict the next white noise term from the previous ones. They're all uncorrelated or, well, independent in the Gaussian case, but even just for uncorrelated white noise, we're trying to do a linear predictor. And the whole idea of being uncorrelated means there's no linear relationship. So yeah, there, we can't do anything. This, this subtraction, this negative term here that I underlined in green would just be zero. So that's no good. Well, I guess it just is what it is. You can't really predict white noise from white noise because it's just noise. Um, the other extreme is that if xt is equal to c, a, not an, a constant, so this is another really, this is an even stupider time series, at least white noise is a reasonable time series. You can't do much with it when it comes to prediction, but you can at least study it. Um, the constant time series is extremely uninteresting, except for the fact that um, we can say that I guess there's there's no notion of variance, so that's kind of well, maybe if we just forget about um yeah, I guess it doesn't even really make sense because you can't really write down the variance. My point was that if everything was one in some sense, if you had something like k x of h is equal to one because every lag would be perfectly correlated with itself um Okay, so this isn't exactly mathematically precise, but I'm still going to write it down anyway, just for fun. Um, this would be for all h greater than or equal to zero. Um, then in this case, you would have something like one minus that thing. But that thing, I think in that case, no, you actually, uh, this this whole example doesn't make any sense. The whole example doesn't make any sense because you can't invert gamma because gamma would be a matrix of all ones. The matrix of all ones is singular, so you can't actually invert it. So that's kind of a dumb example on my part. Sorry about that. We're just gonna cross that one out. But the it doesn't make sense mathematically, but you could still say if xt is constant, is close to constant, then the mean squared prediction error will be, let's say, very small. Which maybe we could make more precise if we really tried to. But uh, that's roughly, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like I said, if you have a constant time series, everything kind of breaks because it doesn't even make sense. But if you had something that's really close to constant, something where the noise is incredibly tiny, and the correlation, I guess the correlation is very strong, Ah, I bet it would be something like a... Nope, never mind. I'm going to stop meandering. Um, I guess I should say it's close to constant, but you would also need to have a um, strong correlation between the um, adjacent points, or otherwise that it also wouldn't make sense because in some sense, white noise could look really close to zero, a very low noise, white noise, but it would still be white noise. You'd still have terrible prediction error. Um, so we'll just forget about that second example. The white noise example makes sense. It's basically the worst possible case for prediction because you can't predict. 
Um, all right, so given all of that, the idea is that in general, inverting a T by T matrix takes, I think, order of T cubed operations. I'm going to put a little question mark here. I'm not like 100% sure, but I'm like 95% sure that it's a cubic. The standard way of inverting a matrix is cubic in time. Um, but yeah, I'd have to double check that to be absolutely sure. Um, however, if gamma, um, well, I should say not not if it's a topless mid is as I should say gamma is something special called a uh, toplets. Yeah, got that right. Toplets matrix. Toplets matrix is basically one where you have constants down the diagonal. So here we see that every diagonal has, you know, if you pick a diagonal, it's the same value down the entire diagonal. Now, if I recall, strictly speaking, I don't think a toplets matrix has to be symmetric. We have the added benefit that our matrix here is also symmetric. Again, I would need to double check my linear algebra to make sure that that is in fact the case, but I'm pretty sure the standard toplets matrix just means that the diagonals are, um, fixed at certain whatever value it is. So the point is that gamma is a topless matrix. So the Durbin Levinson DL algorithm runs in I think it's order T squared time. So it's a pretty nice savings in the sense that you've went from cubic time complexity to quadratic time. And the idea is to, um, well, the idea is iteratively solve for alphas. So rather than try to invert the whole matrix and then just do it, uh, what they're going to do is you're going to try to iteratively solve um, for, in some sense, rows of alphas. And to do that, what I mean is that what we really want is if we go back up to, where did it go now? Oh, it's the very first thing I think I wrote, which is this thing equation way up here. If we consider this prediction, this, you could call this the one step ahead predictor because it's based on all the data up to capital T for predicting T plus one. Well, we could do this for every data point, not just capital T plus one, but we could do it for, well, one and two and three and so on. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider, we'll say consider all one step ahead predictors. And what that gets us is something that's going to look like, well, we're going to use a new notation here. We're going to use superscripts and subscripts. It's kind of annoying to look at, but we need to know what data points are being used to predict what data points. So the notation we'll use here is one, two. And what this means is I'm predicting x2 based on x1 and everything that came before it, which is nothing because x1 is just the first data point. And we're going to have a new alpha is alpha 1, 1, x1. And then the next one down, the next one down is um, x2, 3 which is that I want to predict x3 from x2 and x1. And I'll use the notation here. Pray that I get all the uh, subscripts and superscripts correct. It's going to look something like this. 
So here, alpha 2, 1 and 2, 2 are the alphas for the, I guess, second row of this um, recur or this iteration that we're going to be doing. Anyway, I'm going to write one more out just to make sure it's as clear as possible, which is 3, 4. And then we have an alpha, all right, 3, 1, x1. We have an alpha 3, 2, x2. And we have an alpha 3, 3, x3. So in some sense, we could say, well, I could use, again, the first guy to predict the second guy. And I can use the first two guys to predict the third guy, the first three to predict the fourth, and so on, all the way down to the one that we're actually interested in, the one that we want to solve, which is using all um, t data points to predict the um, t plus first, uh, obs I guess, point in the time series. So this would be a t2, and this would go all the way to t, t, x, t. All right, lots of t's. Now, how do we solve this? Well, if you read up on the Levinson recursion or the Durbin-Levinson algorithm, or sometimes they call it Levinson-Durbin, depending on who you ask, um, you'll find a more general setting for how to actually run this recursion. Now, in these notes, I'm not so concerned with going through all the gritty details of it. Honestly, most of the time, you're probably not even going to think about it. It's happening behind the scenes. But I still think it's good to at least write it down so we know approximately what it's doing, even if we're not going to go through all the gritty linear algebra details. There are text you can find if you want to actually read through all of the gritty details. I just don't think it's overly enlightening to uh, have in this course and rather just spend time doing other things. But that being said, we still got to get through exactly what's going on here. So how do we start this? Well, we start with a zero zero. And what's that equal to? Or I think alpha, sorry, alpha zero zero, which is equal to zero, right? Um, OK, great. And P zero one. So this, yeah, this is terrible notation now that I think about it. I think I copied this. No, no, it should be T. T. No, it, yeah, it should be T. Um, sorry, not T zero one, but T one zero. Yeah. I had this backwards. It should be T zero one, which is the mean squared error of predicting the first data point based on nothing. And that's just the variance. That's like I kind of was ranting about before. Um, the uh, if you're trying to predict a data point based on nothing useful or nothing at all, you just have the noise. The mean squared prediction error is the variance. Ideally, if we it's the worst case scenario. If we had more information, we would reduce this, but we don't at this point in our iteration. All right, so then the idea is we start with this and then, so this is the initialization. And then at some point, given that we've already run this recursion t times to get alpha t one through alpha t little t, little t. So again, the idea is we would run this and every time then we would get the ones row, then we'd get the two row, the three row, now we're at the little t row. And we want to use this to get the next row in our giant recursion here. So let's try that. Well, what we get the answer, I guess, is that alpha t plus one, oh, sorry, comma one, that is the first column, alpha t plus one comma one. So the, the first coefficient that we're trying to estimate, 
Well, we can get that by using the previous coefficient. So first we need the auto correlation rho at time t. I just want to double check. No, I think it's t plus 1. Yeah, I have to double update those notes. Yeah, so this is at t plus 1. And then we sum i from 1 to t of alpha t i and then rho x i and in the denominator well we get a one here and we have a sum i from one to t and now we have kind of the same thing but with one difference now we're running the auto correlation backwards t minus i okay so what's going on there well it's um it's part of this iterative algorithm which involves kind of you, you can if you read up on it you can see there's kind of like a forward and a backwards vector going on here but um one way that i like to think about this is that if i multiply the top and the bottom by the auto covariance then well what what's the what what's the auto correlation it's the auto covariance divided by the variance which is just kx at zero so if i do that then what i end up with is something that's going to look like kx at lag t plus one minus the sum i from one to t alpha t i k x at lag i divided by the variance k x at lag zero minus the sum i from one to t alpha t i k x at t minus i right so i'm not sure if that actually helps make things a little clearer um but you can kind of imagine what's going on here in the sense that I am uh, I have my linear combination here of auto covariances um, in both the numerator and the denominator going forward and going backward in some sense because of I versus minus I. Um, and I'm looking at the difference between this prediction. I say prediction because it's not really a prediction, but it's based on the alphas. Um, for the next auto covariance versus this for the, um, I guess the variance, which would be at lag um, zero. Just double checking to make sure I got that right. Anyway, the, um, again, the, the finer details are not super critical, but the what we're doing here is we're iteratively sol um, doing these linear combinations of auto covariances to get rows, well, to get, I guess what we're doing is we're taking all of these guys and using them to get the next one. And then the question is, well, what about the other alphas in that row? Um, well, the other alphas can be computed, I guess, in... Uh, so this is the first guy. And then the next alpha, I'll say then the next alpha which is or the next alphas alpha t plus one i for i greater than one is going to be alpha t t minus i minus one minus alpha let's say t plus one one alpha t i okay so we use the double check to make sure that's actually supposed to be a one and not an i but we use the we use this first measurement to um compute the uh, coefficients for the all the rest of them all I want to do is double check. No, it can't be an I, but it could be an I. 
Not that seems like that makes sense. Um, and then lastly, what you can do is you can update the mean squared error. And the mean squared error is, remember for, I think I have this again, yeah, no, t for t plus 1. Uh, is going to be the mean squared error of the previous step, which is predicting time point t from t minus 1 time points times 1 minus alpha squared t plus 1, 1. All right, we're just having a few technical difficulties today, um, but we are slowly working our way through the lecture so where were we well what i was saying is that all right we have this algorithm it's not the most interesting thing to uh stare at unless you really like numerical linear algebra the summary is that inverting a giant matrix is hard on the other hand if we have a nice type of matrix like a toplitz matrix then solving a linear system based on that matrix is easier to do and you can do it in an iterative fashion, and you can use it to get your um, one step ahead predictions um, going all the way from the first guy all the way up to the teeth, the capital teeth guy um, going through here. Um, and you can also get the mean squared errors along the way. The mean squared errors are updated by multiplying by one minus alpha squared so that's kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of telling you, um, I guess in some sense, how much influence is the first element having on the teeth element, right? This is kind of saying, here we have the, um, the coefficient for x1. So in a sense, it's saying when I'm trying to predict let's say predict t plus 1. When I'm trying to predict t plus 1, um, what sort of benefit, what help am I getting from the first guy who's kind of far away? So when we start this, right, we're using the, the, like the first data point to predict the second. So if we have an AR1 process, well, that's going to be useful. Um, but as we go further along, then suddenly that first guy probably won't be giving us any new information when little t is big. Um, so the mean squared error will probably stop updating at that point. It'll just be multiplying by one, which tells us that, okay, we've kind of, we have like a finite uh, horizon for how useful that first data point is. But anyway, staring at these equations can sometimes give you some intuition it doesn't give you a lot of intuition, at least in my opinion, but at least you can get a little bit from it. Now we're moving forward and we're going to look at something called innovations. The innovations algorithm. So the innovation algorithm, well, first of all, what's an innovation? Uh, you might have seen this term floating, floating around as you looked at time series texts. Um, but we need to talk about, well, an innovation. I've never quite figured out where this uh, terminology came from, innovation. I need to do a better job at looking this up. But um, an innovation is basically the residual for the one step ahead estimator. So an innovation is a, I should say the or a residual for the one step ahead estimate, i.e. if we want to look at it for, well, I guess for time point t, what we're saying is it's going to be xt minus the prediction of xt based on all the previous time points. So again, we're using this notation with the superscript 
t minus 1 to say that x hat here is predicting time point t based on t minus 1 and all the past data. So that's what it is. It's, I mean, this formula is the residual. It is the teeth innovation, I guess, for our time series. Um, so first of all, I guess a good thing to be aware of is that x t minus x hat t t minus 1 and x s x hat s s plus 1, sorry, minus 1, because we're using the previous time points to predict s. Well, these two things are uncorrelated for t not equal to s. Otherwise, it's, of course, they're going to be correlated because they're the same thing. But um, that's kind of neat because, well, first of all, why, why would they be uncorrelated, right? Because in some sense, when you're computing a residual for this, when you're computing the re or a, like the, a residual for the prediction here, you're sort of taking xt and then you're kind of subtracting off all of the information about xt that you can get from the previous time points, t minus 1 all the way down to 1. So in some sense, the teeth innovation or the teeth residual is really just saying, what's the new information that came with xt that I didn't know about before I got to xt? So it's effectively like the extra noise that's coming into the series that is not dependent on the previous time points. Um, I feel like you could almost think of a time series like this, where you have, um, right, you have like one, two, three, four, and then you have some influence through time, but then you also have like white noise going in at every time point, kind of injecting some noise in as well. So in some sense, the innovation or the residual is just telling us what is unknown, what is new that is not that, that about the, the teeth time point that is not was not known from the previous time points. Um, and in that case, if you have to, it's sort of like localized in time. You're not going to have correlations then between X, uh, well, the, the teeth innovation and the S, S <laughs> innovation. You can't really say that, can you? Um, the S innovation. But that's going to be actually really important because um, then the covariance matrix for the innovations is diagonal. And diagonal matrices are great because you can invert them really easily and they're pretty nice to work with compared to just about any other matrix that you have to deal with. Even topless matrices are still a lot worse than uh, diagonal matrices which I guess are a trivial special case of topless matrices, but ah, forget that. Anyway, uh, okay, so what in the world is the innovations algorithm? I told you what the innovations are. They're the one step ahead prediction uh, residuals. What does the algorithm say? Well, the algorithm says first we initialize as usual. And in this case, we're going to initialize x hat 0 of 1 at 1 to be 0. So this is the prediction of the first time point based on the 0th time point where we don't have any information and we're going to predict it to be 0. Again, we're always centering the mean first so that it should be mean 0. So it's reasonable to say that, well, if it's mean 0 and I don't know anything else, I might as well guess 0 being the mean as my prediction. Then what we do is, okay, then we also write down the usual P 
um, zero one, which is the mean squared prediction error, which is just the variance of the process. So that's not too exciting. But then the idea is, so then the next step is that given um, observations x t through x one and predictions x hat t t minus one all the way down to I guess x this kind of silly one which is x zero one hat um, then compute well what are we computing we're going to compute the t plus first um, estimator or the prediction I should say which is going to be the sum j from 1 to t of let's see theta theta is kind of a very specific uh, choice in in uh, um, notation here but right now it's theta is just a coefficient um, and we're applying it to the uh, let's make sure we do this right the yeah the um, x t plus j minus first or the x plus one minus j innovation which is just the same subscript t plus one minus j hat with a t minus j plus one minus one etc in the um in the numerator so if we stare at this for a second let's not do the rest of the innovations algorithm what we're saying is that if we have a bunch of predictions um yeah i didn't actually tell you what the thetas are the thetas are coming but the thetas are just some numbers at the moment so what are we doing here well what we're doing here is we're trying to predict the t plus first observation based on the previous t innovations or the previous t residuals now this is in contrast to durbin levinson above where what we're trying to do is predict the teeth observation the t plus first observation from the first t raw observations and what happens with durbin levinson is that these t observations are correlated with each other because unless they're all white noise in which case it's kind of silly to do prediction anyway but the point is that for regular time series models arma models arima models and whatnot these x's will have some correlation and that comes right into play when we go back to that crazy matrix of gammas at the beginning of today's lecture i keep scrolling back up but uh, there's a lot to show you up there at the top so innovations is kind of this equation is kind of doing the same thing it's saying i'm going to predict based on a linear combination of the past observations but now we're not doing past observations alone we're doing past residuals or past innovations and these things are uncorrelated with each other which makes life a little bit nicer i still haven't told you what theta is but we're getting there um, anyway the idea is that given some theta which i will write down in a second we can um, do a linear have a linear predictor in terms of the innovations for the teeth uh, t plus first time point and at the same time we can also update our mean squared prediction error and we update the mean squared prediction error by basically saying it's the variance which again is again the worst case mean squared prediction error you can have um, I hope it can't get any worse than that or else something's probably wrong and then what we're going to do is we're going to sum j from zero to t minus one and we're going to sum those thetas again which i still haven't told you what they are but we're getting there uh t t minus j and the previous mean squared prediction errors 
Okay, so up to not telling you what theta is yet, what we're saying is that the current mean squared prediction error is the variance minus a linear combination of the past mean squared prediction errors. Then the last thing to figure out is what is theta? Well, theta is also, I can also write that down, t, t minus j, what do we have here? Oh yeah, I forgot this is also also kind of a mess. K X T minus J. So the auto covariant at lag T minus J and the sum K from zero to J. I probably shouldn't use K, but it's little K, I guess, sub versus big K. And then we're summing this j, j minus k. Iterative algorithms are just the worst, right? T, t minus k, p, the mean squared prediction error, and in the denominator, we have a one divided by p, j j plus one. Okay, so theta is kind of a mess. Um, it's again recursively defined based on previous values of theta. So what you would have to do is start at the very top where um, I guess in that case I probably didn't initialize it, but I guess we'd want to initialize theta probably to zero or something. Um, and then we would work through this by summing the previous values of theta in row t. So if this is the row and this is kind of the column um, index or indices, then we're summing from k from zero to uh, j minus one. So we're kind of going through the thetas. Um, and then on the other side here, we're also going, I guess, through the, well, at the jth row, we're also going um, through the thetas again. So yeah, it's kind of a mess. I don't really like these big equations that show up in time series because I find that they're not the most intuitively interesting bits. Um, the intuitively interesting thing that I like is the innovations themselves, the idea that we're just trying a different linear, a linear combination of different things based on the data um, in order to predict the T plus first guy. Um, but we are going to do an example which will hopefully make this a little bit clearer. So the example that we're going to do um, the example is uh, so the okay so the 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 hint is that we chose thetas because the thetas are going to actually be really closely related to the moving average process and that the innovations algorithm is going to be useful for moving averages. So maybe before we do the example, oh, now OneNote's not erasing. There we go. So before we do the example, I want to um, stare at this thing for a moment. So let's go back to the Durbin Levinson algorithm. And if xt is an AR process, then the big system of equations becomes a small system of equations because in that case again the we're, we're trying to do this giant linear combination but if we have an AR process with order P we know that all we have to do is go P time points back in time to predict the current time or the next time point Right. Anything after that is completely irrelevant because of the way the model works. Right. But so that's why let me write that down before I throw out the but. 
right? Xt is equal to Wt plus the sum um, I from 1 to P of phi I Xt minus I. So again, if we're trying to predict the teeth or the t plus first guy based on the entire past, we only need the previous p time point if we know we have an AR process. So the Durbin Levinson is kind of good for AR. Well, okay, well, what happens if we have an MA process? Well, if we have an, a moving average process, remember what we can do. If we have, I should say, an invertible moving average process, what does that mean? Well, the invertible moving average process is going to look something like this. So this is maybe a, actually, well, I'll just write it here. And remember what that's going to look like. It's going to look like an infinite sum into the past, not phi and or phi anymore, but I forget the notation I was using in the previous lecture. I think it might have been pi's. So we'll just try pi, pi i, x t minus i. So again, this is infinity. Well, infinity doesn't really exist in data. So we could replace this with a capital T, um, or I guess, sorry, not a capital T because I'm using lowercase t here. So we could have a T minus one. Um, so the idea is that if we have an AR process, we just have P time points we need. If we have an MA process, we need the entire series to do the, um, um, to to solve that linear system equation so what we'll say is bad for m a mainly because i have a p up here and i have an infinity or a t minus one there so that's really where the durbin levinson algorithm comes in it says okay this is great we can solve this system of equations if the time horizon, right? If the, if, if the causality kind of bit is, is, is short, if we only need P X's, then I don't need to solve a big system of equations. But if I'm in this MA case, I have, I can write this as in invertible format as an infinite sum of X's going back into the past. That's a lot of X's to put into your linear system of equations. So it's not great. On the other hand, by destroying the correlations, by basically doing this subtraction, the innovations algorithm um, is better for, so the, we'll say innovations is, I'll say not that it's not good for AR, but it is particularly, particularly good for MA and ARMA models. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an example of that to try to see what's going on. So now we can jump into the quick example. And the example is going to be a moving average process. Well, it's just going to be the MA1 process because if we're going to do an example, we might as well keep it simple uh, since these things always get complicated as we go forward, All right? This is just our M A one process. All right. Um, okay. So how are we going to do this? Well, first step one, what's the auto covariance? We've done that before. It's just going to be Sigma squared times one plus theta squared. Um, and what's the auto covariance at lag one? It's going to be, well, sigma squared again times theta, and then it's going to be zero. No, not zero, kx 
I'm putting zeros everywhere but where I'm supposed to. Kx at lag h is going to be zero for h greater than or equal to two. All right, so these are the things we need to know. And then we start, ah, so I had my start there backwards. I forgot to put this in. We start with theta zero, zero equal to one. Not zero, but equal to one. And, well, what happens? All right, so we start with theta zero, zero equal to one. And where do we go from there? Well, by going up to that formula that, um, well, the crazy formula for theta here, which it looks really annoying when it's written in general, but when we do it for just an MA1 process, it's not so bad. What we get is theta. I know I'm kind of reusing theta, but there's, you'll see how we go, what's coming here. Then we get a theta one one, and that is just going to be the auto covariance at lag one minus well zero divided by the auto covariance at lag zero minus zero and this from what we have up above is just going to be theta divided by one plus theta squared and it turns out that this is equal to sigma squared theta divided by the mean squared prediction error at um, lag, well not lag, the mean squared prediction error at time one. Remember this thing is, again, the notation can be confusing. This is just kx zero. So all I'm doing is I'm, I'm undoing what I did in the first place, which was canceling out the, um, uh, the sigma squared, but it's just a different way to write it. Um, just to double check the equation above. See, this is kind of the reason why I'm writing it this way is so we can see what the, what it looks like with the, um, mean squared prediction error there in the denominator. Okay. So that's just the first, um, coefficient for the, I guess, first row of our recursion. Now for the second row in our recursion, we start with theta two, two, and what we get is kx at lag two minus zero. And we divide that, well, once again, by the same thing, kx at lag zero minus zero. I guess I don't really need the square brackets there. Um, and this is just going to be zero because again, the auto covariance here is zero. All right, so that's easy. When we go to the next, so now there's two coefficients right in this row. We have a theta two, two and a theta two, one. For theta two, one, what we get is we get kx at lag one and then we subtract theta one one and theta two two it's going to be zero again based on the previous line but let's write it all out times the mean squared prediction error at i guess of for for the first time point and we're going to divide this all by the mean squared prediction error for the second time point and this crazy thing, well, the second term here again is just zero. The first term, we know what it is. It's going to be sigma squared times theta. And we're going to be dividing by, oh, look, it's the mean squared prediction error. So that's why I wrote this in this way, right? You can kind of see where we're going with this. If we continue this pattern, what we find is that theta t comma j is going to be zero for j greater than one and theta t comma one just happens to be um, sigma squared theta 
divided by P T T sorry minus one. Yes. Okay, so what it means is that most of the coefficients, the thetas in the theta, you know, sub i sub j or sub t sub j are going to be zero in the above um, recursion. So staring at this thing again, again, it's kind of messy to look at, but ultimately because that theta 2, 2 is zero, it starts propagating and a lot of these things end up being zero, especially also because I should say the auto covariance um, will be zero for most positive lags any lag two or greater. So these are mostly zero and that makes the entire recursion quite simple. Again, it's one of the reasons why people like this innovation to algorithm specifically for moving average processes. All right, so what does this mean? Well, so furthermore, we can update the mean squared prediction error, which is going to be, right, these denominators that I haven't actually computed yet. And we can write that as one plus theta squared minus theta and theta t minus one sigma squared. All right, so again, why? Well, if we go back up here, we have this formula that sort of popped out of the, um, that popped out of the method here, the algorithm. Um, and yeah, we have our, well, we have the one plus theta squared coming from this, and then we have some subtraction happening over there. I have to double check to make sure that's actually, I feel like that thing should be squared. Nope. Wait, no, I know, I think that's fine. So when we put it all together, <laughs> we're almost there. Putting it together, what we end up with is a one step ahead prediction, predictor, um, prediction, something like this, which is going to be theta t minus one x t minus x hat t minus one t. Again, it's we're just predicting the current the I guess that we're predicting the next time point based solely on the previous innovation and nothing else. So that entire linear combination just becomes one term because all the other thetas, sorry, that's not supposed to be a minus one, that's supposed to be a comma one. All the other thetas are going to be zero. And if we write this out using the other notation, we get theta, which is not one of the coefficients, it's the MA, it's the MA uh, term. Sorry, I probably should have used a different theta than a theta. Anyway, we end up with something that looks like this. So if we stare at this for a little bit, what are we, oh, I forgot the hat. What are we saying? Well, we're saying that um, if we want to predict the next guy in our time series, we can use the residual, the innovation from the current um, time, multiply that by theta, our moving average piece, and then we scale it by, I guess, sigma squared and the, um, 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 the mean squared prediction error. So why is this interesting? Well, first of all, it's interesting because it's kind of a simple formula, um, but also note that, um, how do I wanna say this? Um, I 
Well, what I'm trying to say is that this difference is kind of like trying to figure out what the white noise is because if you're if you're looking at the residual like what's a residual a residual is kind of trying to i don't want to say predict because you're not predicting the noise it's trying to get a sense of what the noise is we can we know where we think we're going and then there's going to be some added noise on top of that so in some sense we're trying to get a handle of the white noise term and use that to predict the next guy um yeah, I feel like rather than jumping into a whole bunch of R code now, we'll save the R code for the next lecture. And I'm going to ramble a little bit more about these uh, AR and MA processes. So um, to see if hopefully this makes a little bit more sense. If we have an AR1 process, we have something like XT is equal to phi XT minus 1 plus WT. So the point is that if... I have a good guess for phi and x t minus 1, then I predict x hat t to just be whatever phi hat x t minus 1 hat. And this is just sort of saying, well, if I can, if I have a good guess, maybe actually I don't need a hat here because maybe I already know what this value is. If a good guess for phi, and if I know what this is, so if I can take a good guess at what the coefficient phi is, and I know what x is, then I can predict the next guy by just taking the x t minus one and multiplying by phi hat. It's sort of like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, but the problem is the MA process because if I have XT is equal to theta WT minus one plus WT, well, a good guess for X hat T is well, theta hat and w hat t minus 1. But then you think, well, wait, what in the world is w hat? How am I supposed to predict the white noise? Well, I kind of predict the white noise um, by looking at the, um, the residual. And, of course, we scale it by sigma squared and all this other stuff is going on here. Um, so there's a couple little scaling things that go on in this formula up here. But um, yeah, x hat t, t minus 1. So roughly speaking, now I don't want to say this is equal. We're not actually predicting white noise. But one of the key things to note with this is that, um, again, we don't, we don't have w. We never have w. We don't know what it is. It's kind of some hypothetical white noise that's driving our time series from behind the scenes. But we can try to get a hint at what it is by predicting the t minus first time point, looking at the actual t minus first time point and seeing how they differ and saying, well, this is what I think it should be. This is what it actually is. The difference is going to kind of be like an approximation of the white noise. Um, so that's why that's kind of the intuition behind what this innovations approach is doing. It's saying, let's try to pretend we know what the white noise is and then write our predictor, our one step ahead predictor as a linear combination of these white noise pieces or these residuals. In the AR case, we have the actual data, so we can just write down and say, well, if I have the data points, I can just write a linear predictor for the next data point based on the current data points. So that's the big difference. Again, these two things, these two pieces are very, there's a lot of really interesting detail in the AR and the MA process. The AR process has only, only requires P time points to really understand, whereas the MA process in some sense is infinite um to actually understand it um 
but then there's other weird issues um, that go on. Like in the MA case, the auto covariance eventually just goes to zero, whereas in the AR case, it never strictly goes to zero. It just gets close to zero. So yeah, there's a lot of weird quirks that go on in time series. Um, and we're gonna we're not done yet, of course. We're only just a little bit more than halfway through the lecture. So we have a lot more to do. What I want to do, what I don't have time to do right now, is to actually look into um, a lot of forecasting methods in time series. But I think what we're going to do is what we will do instead is look at estimation for the ARMA model, forecasting for ARMA, which is kind of the same idea. And then after all of that, we can spend some good time in R trying to look at how to do forecasting for these time series, because there's a lot of other little quirks that come into play when we actually try to work with real data. Like here on, pay, on the page, we're kind of still working hypothetically with the equations, but when we jump into the real data, then things become, uh, well, even more interesting. And we can try to see what happens and how we can do forecasting for our time series. But that we're gonna save for the uh, next lecture. So I will see you in those lectures.